my talk. So we initially talked about this idea as beernomics, right? The economics of beer. But once I started looking into the story of beer and the economies of beer and everything else, I just had to really, really talk about big beer because this is something that really, really bothers me. And um, specifically, big beer and the unicorn hedge, which we'll get to. So some disclaimers up first. I'm not a, in the beer industry at all. I'm just a super beer geek. I have been since I was in college and when I went to England and found out that there's actually better beer in this world than golden anniversary which one drinks in upstate New York when one has nothing else to do except drink really bad beer. <laughs> so this was uh, absolutely formative because it's really important to know that there are other beers out there that are really, really great. Homebrew, trade, seller, super nerd. I'm not an economist. Super. <laughs> you got to know this. This is a layman's uh, interpretation of not just economics but also thinkers and how they think. Um, and I'm also not a unicorn. But I am uh, unapologetically uh, incredibly strident. I have a lot of opinions. I've always been this way. I think I was probably a terrible kid. But you know, when you're writing letters to the editor at you know seven or eight, um, this is how you turn out. So this is where I am. So I uh, am against corporate corporations, uh, multinational corporations that run the world. I buy nothing on the day after Thanksgiving because that should be celebrated as Buy Nothing Day. Um, and if you've ever read Ad Busters magazine. This is how I was so greatly influenced as a teenager. <laughs> so what I do do, um, I work at O'Reilly Media. I am a director. Uh, you may know O'Reilly from our programming books on all sorts of different kinds of technology. We also run conferences across the country and around the world on all those said technologies. We also have um, a very values-based kind of philosophy, and that's work on stuff that matters, which is good because it actually parallels nicely with my insane opinions about things. Now, um, the other important thing about O'Reilly is that we are headed by Tim O'Reilly, who is also a thinker within Silicon Valley. You know, this is my standard line. Inc. Magazine called him the, um, like, the seer of Silicon Valley or whatever. I'm like, I just call him Tim. Like, you know, <laughs> he's just Tim to me. So what we're thinking about now is how do you create more value than you capture in the next economy? And the next economy is the future of work, and in the very O'Reilly way of thinking about this, it's everything from mi fair minimum wage to augmenting humans with technology, not replacing them in places of work. So we are kind of running the whole entire gamut. That conference is actually next week in San Francisco. If you'd like to know more about it, just let me know. Um, and we're super excited about it. So one of the topics that we were talking about on one of the conference calls, planning the conference, was Tim said, I went into a beer store, and there were 42 different kinds of IPAs. Why is that? And I thought, I know the answer to this question. <laughs> Do I ever? First of all, let's just think about the fact that we now have beer stores, right? This is not just the rarefied air that belongs to wine connoisseurs. Beer geeks get their own place to, to geek out, love, really just enjoy lots of different kinds of craft beers. Their families get a place to give them a gift certificate at Christmas because now there's a default place they know that you'll like. Um, and, but there's another, there's lots of reasons. So we actually had a micro craft beer boom in the 1999, 2000s, before 2001. Kind of lasted to 2002 or so. It fizzled out. That's when you could literally drive to every single New England brewery in a couple weekends and not have a too hard a time of it. Um, and now, though, there are certain economic conditions that are making it. This is the prime time to open a brewery. And I say that because in Massachusetts, 26 opened in this one year. So just in 2016, 26 have opened. So the economy is good. We all know that. Um, Hyperlocal distribution. So it's like, hey, I belong to a CSA, Community Supported Agriculture. I can also belong to this beer club for the brewery that makes beer down the street from me. That's awesome. Um, the other thing is there's just more and more business models for breweries. They're not just straight up selling you beer. There's lots of restaurants, lots of really interesting things happening in communities. There's one in Vermont um, called Stone Corral, and they opened in a small town called Richmond. And um, part of it was that the citizens were super excited that they would come to Richmond and build this brewery because then they would be the largest water user in town. And when you have this pooled resource, your water bill will go down because now you have someone else using a lot of water. So it was actually a good thing. So there's kind of a lot of thinking, really deliberate, really careful when opening breweries in this way. 
Some are just opening to get rich quick, but that's another thing. Um, and then we have macro beer, which is beyond big. But what I've done is the subversive <coughs> taking stills from the Super Bowl ad this last year, which drove all of us craft beer geeks crazy when Budweiser decided to try to do a takedown of the craft beer industry. So when we think about the big, big economy, the worldwide economy, there are certain characteristics that superstar companies have. Now, the economists call these companies superstars. They did this great series of um, pieces about what it means to live in this multinational world where, where we used to have everything broken up, has now combined again, and now we have these mega corporations and how they run the world. So characteristics are you buy your rival, squeeze costs, run the system, meaning you hire lots of lobbyists, you employ lots of trade groups, you cut jobs, and this is such a topic for this week, <laughs> you avoid paying taxes. So how big is big? Microsoft bought LinkedIn for $25 billion. Anheuser-Busch bought SAB Miller for $108 billion. Four times. Four times. This is how big beer is. These are all the, co the companies that were sold this year. Monsanto. You can't get more evil than Monsanto. <laughs> so here you have SAB Miller, which is itself a, a conglomeration of many other beer companies, as is Anheuser-Busch InBev, which is... Um, who bought SAB Miller. So now we have this enormous deal going on in the market and it, it changes things a lot. So here are some other important facts, especially when you um, like to boycott big multinational corporations and talks like this get you really excited. Um, five of the largest banks control 45% of the world's wealth. Can't help but think of that scene from Batman when Catwoman says to Bruce Wayne, for so long, so many of you had so much. And this is true, right? For so long, so many have had so much. So top three companies in Silicon Valley are valued at $47 billion, and they have 137 employees. So just remember that number because it's important. 10% of the profits are controlled by, sorry, 10% of the companies are controlled, they control 80% of the world's profits. This is what Peter Thiel thinks. Competition is for losers. So when you are talking about philosophy in the Silicon Valley, ivory tower, echo chamber, let's really think about what we're talking about. Because in America, competition is not for losers. Competition is what's supposed to create this fair playing field. And when it stops doing that, then there are losers. And guess who they are? It's us. So multinational conglomerates then traffic their money through holding corporations so they avoid paying taxes. 46 billion, almost twice, is laundered through these holding corporations and they never, no, no one pays taxes on them. And I, I, you know, not to get too political, but this is one of these things that as a citizen of this country, and as a citizen of your country, you should really be proud of paying taxes because it funds the police and fills the potholes and puts our kids through school and, yeah, I know. It's, it's hard to pay up every year, but there's a reason for it. Because we live in a society, we live in a community. So if competition is for losers, what happens when Anheuser-Busch controls the beer population, of the, the beer economy of the world? One out of every three beers sold in the entire world will be an Anheuser-Busch product. One out of every three. <laughs> tell me. Tell me. And guess what? You're not going to know which one it is. So, again, our friend Peter, monopoly is the condition of every successful business. So his thinking is, look, you got a monopoly. It's great. You've stomped out all your rivals. Now you have all this time, energy, and money to focus on making really great stuff and innovating. Anyone? Anyone? Anheuser-Busch, shock talk. What else do I have to say? No one drinks that beer. Why didn't they ask me first? I would have been like, that's not innovation. It's crap. So this is what we have. No joke. These are from, I did not make these headlines up. I really okay, wish I had. The beer Voltron one, that's pretty good. Uh, that's just beer. <laughs> uh, these are real headlines. So Voltron, for those who don't know, is a type of transformer that assembles. I didn't, I don't know. It's I, did, great. I too grew up in rural Maine. 
Please tell us. Scarily chopped up is the fastest growing craft beer. So unfortunately, people will see the chopped up. So it is one of those things where you're still like, if that's the best you can do, though, and that's innovation, then why are you doing this? So um, yeah. Duopoly is just a nicer word for monopoly because actually that's what it is after because Anheuser-Busch will assume the SAB Miller name. Um, so this is what we're talking about. So enter the unicorn. Dave McClure wrote this fantastic article on Medium and basically has said in tech, we're super used to big companies buying small companies. How many in this room in the last two years have been bought and sold? Yeah, there's... Like two years ago, there was so many people who had literally been bought by Cisco, like the week before Monktoberfest. I was like, formerly known as, oh yeah, 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 okay, I got you. Now Cisco and or or IBM or you know, it's just this is what happens in the tech industry. But you get bought and sold, and this is the way it is. Um, but now his whole point is now these other companies are starting to get in on this. Walmart bought Jet.com, Unilever, Dollar Shave Club, all for more than a billion dollars. GM bought a um, driverless car technology. And then you have, I just love this example, so LinkedIn bought Linda for a billion dollars last year, and then Microsoft, of course, bought LinkedIn for $25 billion. So now you're seeing um, traditional companies kind of also participating in the unicorn hedge, where they are buying the competition because they themselves cannot innovate. So as Dave McClure says, CEO buys unicorn, to avoid disruption. This is the unicorn hedge. Characteristics of the unicorn hedge, global public companies are overvalued dinosaurs. So the economist superstars are Dave McClure's dinosaurs. Startups are disrupting the status quo. Disruptors are acquired, assimilated. The younger the unicorn, the better. It sounds so creepy, but that's exactly what it is. <laughs> because the faster you can take your competition out of the market, the better it is for you. And then there's just so much money. These companies do just have so much money they throw it around. So I'm going to read this as how I imagine Dave McClure thinking about it in his head, because he wrote it like a crazy man. His emphasis and caps are all his. The real twist. We'll be watching a bunch of CEOs, sorry, a bunch of senile, senior citizen, Fortune 500 CEOs, and out of touch Gordon Gecko, private equity, barbarians at the gate get beat like a drum by tech startups and VCs, half their age, and twice as greedy. So yeah, this is actually, this is what's happening. And so this is Unicorn Hedge, and I think he's right. Because when we apply, this philosophy and this kind of idea to beer, this is what we see. Big beer versus the competition. 32% of the market, right here, right? So SAB Miller plus InBev, 32% of the market. Next comp competitor, Heineken. Single digit, 9% of the market. How, how do you have this? That's, that's really, really interesting for us that, um, people that like to watch the beer market. 9% um, versus 32%, that's just gonna throw off economies of scale in every which way. But really what's interesting actually is Anheuser-Busch has 155,000 employees. So one company, right, that's technically valued, you know, 200, $300 billion company. So not the same as the three companies in Silicon Valley, but the same number of workforce for one company. And then you look how lean SAB Miller is at 69,000 employees. There's a reason for that. SAB Miller runs the leanest machine possible. They um, cut costs at every point. And one of the founders has famously said, costs are like fingernails. You need to cut them all the time. So once this philosophy comes into Anheuser-Busch's sad, sad world, it's, it's gonna be tough. Because then you're looking at how does the world's largest beer company then trim costs, trim expenses in a way that actually brings home as much profits as possible for all the stake, uh, the shareholders. So these are only some of the beer brands. Basically, every single continent 
every imaginable brand of beer that you actually recognize is most likely owned by Anheuser-Busch. So some of the ones that you know, you're still sometimes surprised about, Foster's, Australia, Pilsner Appel, um, Natty Light, sure. <laughs> so the state of big beer in the United States. <laughs> Natty Light instead of Golden Anniversary. Um, the market share is down. They've missed earnings, sales of the premium flagship brands of Budweiser and uh, Bud Light are down as well, and Kraft is up. And so that then takes beer, big beer's attention, and it's like, oh, what's interesting over here? This craft beer people. So um, I see your point completely about Shock Top, and then don't forget Coors tried to do that with Blue Moon um, a couple years ago, well, a decade ago now. The other thing is that customers want more choice, right? So millennials especially are used to having tons of choice. You go into a bar, you get like your bespoke hamburger, you want your bespoke beer to go with your hamburger. Like this is the way it works. Like you want to know the story behind the beer. You're not going to want to know the story behind the beer if it's a, you know, Anheuser-Busch. You want to fuss over your beer. You want to be a beer nerd. You want to be educated in this. So the definition of craft, this is um, a specific definition that the American Brewers Association has come up with. So you have to brew less than six million barrels of beer, and there's a reason for that. So that number is not arbitrary. Sam Adams and Yuling Ling brew about six million barrels of beer. So they want to stay within that craft definition because if not, they're then seen as kind of like this in this no man's land. They're not in craft and they're not big beer. They're kind of just in the middle somewhere. And that would be bad for Sam Adams. We still, I mean, when I'm at an airport and I see Sam Adams on the draft list, I'm just so thankful because I'm like, finally, some kind of good beer that you can have um, that you know is good. So the other thing is like um, independent. So you have to be owned 20% less you can have investments and you can have outside owners, but they have to own less than 20% of your, your brewery. So these are all fair and good um, measurements. Of course, you have to actually brew beer. Or malt. Flavored malt beverages are not considered beer. So your granddad's root beer, which, side note, is actually how Budweiser is making so much money this year. That granddad's old-fashioned root beer is apparently extraordinarily popular. So the state of craft... Not negligible, $22 billion. That's a lot of pesos for someone like InBev to pick up. <coughs> Ton of breweries. They said the number could be up to 6,000 next year. So 4,200 craft breweries opening, 12% of the market share. Um, there's debate that the craft market is actually down this year. But uh, again, economists at the American Brewers Association have said, <coughs> if you take out the big craft beers, like New Belgium and Sam Adams, Craft is actually up. So people are definitely supporting their local breweries a bit more than kind of the, the bigger craft um, brands. And this is just two years of growth. So in Maine, we're up 40%. Massachusetts, 30%. Poor old Oklahoma and Alaska. No breweries. The other thing that's interesting about this, and again, this is a completely different talk, is the rules around alcohol. So... Um, one of the Midwestern states that I forget right now actually lessened their um, restrictions on high alcohol beers. So before you could only brew beers that were up to 8% alcohol and they released the cap. So we know how much we like big beer. It's really nice to have that opportunity to have something delicious and if you're a brewer, you don't want to be restricted by the state saying you can't sell a 12% beer. New England juice bombs. This is a real thing. So Maine, They've done surveys of tourists that come through the state of Maine, 35% visit a brewery. $270 million each year goes to Vermont's in uh, economic impact directly tied to the beers and brewery industry. And also in Vermont, you have crazy high taxes. So yeah, 41% of every dollar goes to the state. That's awesome. That's a lot of money. That's a lot of public schools. That's a lot of potholes filled. That's a lot of cops hired. Massachusetts, this is no joke. $22 four packs, $132 a case. When? Since when is beer $132 a case? So, who likes $132 case beers? And has Bush and Bev. Because they're selling, what, $15 a case Bud Light? So, this is time, right? This is the unicorn hedge. And it's already happening. So, again, we're applying this now to big beer. Companies are overvalued. Big beer, no problem about that. 
uh, status quo, or the startups, um, or the craft brewers are disrupting the status quo, disruptors are assimilated. Like Elysian is the forerunners of the independent craft beer movement based out of Washington. These are the people who are like, screw big beer, we're gonna make the best beer we possibly can and thumb their nose at everyone else. <coughs> they too were acquired by Anheuser-Busch. The young unicorns go fast, so Golden Road is in um, Los Angeles and the rumor was always that they were built to sell. We know startups that are like that. That's fine. And of course, they're hedging the, the public money. Um, so big beer. In the last two years, this is what big beer has bought. These on the, on the right are uh, SAB Miller brands, and on the left are Anheuser-Busch. Anytime I saw this in the economic report of Anheuser-Busch, that spending $50 million was an immaterial impact, I couldn't believe it. That is an enormous amount of money, and it's not for Anheuser-Busch. It's not when you own one out of every three beers that are sold in the, in, in the world. It's not when you own 32% of the market. So if they have this kind of scratch to throw around, the assimilation is going to happen fast. So you know, here we have Elysian, um, Golden Road, Breckenridge, Four Peaks, which I'm not familiar with. Um, anyway, so you may have see your local beer in here. So, um, of course, probably the most painful is Goose Island, because everyone's always loved Bourbon County brand stout. They've done a perfectly fine job of continuing that brand, allowing more production. You can actually get it now. You don't always have to wait in line on thanks the day after Thanksgiving to get it. Um, Anheuser-Busch was incredibly generous to my women's beer group and gave us a couple cases of which we promptly drank and made brownies out of. So <laughs> yeah, enjoy your beer. That's what's important here. Um, Lining Kugels, I mean, that's a brand that's been around the Midwest for, for a long time. So, um, but you know, not everyone's okay with this. So Dick Cantwell founded Elysian Brewing, and he's just like, don't you think there could have been another option than to selling out to Anheuser-Busch? He then left the brewery, because he's, what set him off was Super Bowl Sunday. And he's watching, and the Budweiser beer ad comes on, and it says, who drinks pumpkin peach beer? And he's like, I make that beer. Elysian makes pumpkin peach beer. And here was Budweiser, who just bought Elysian, saying, well, we don't know what's in our brand portfolio. Let's just make fun of the craft beer loving hipsters and all of their pumpkin peach beer. So it doesn't stop there, right? Ballast Point was going to IPO anyway. So instead, they got bought by Constellation. Constellation makes and distributes Modelo, a bunch of other spirit brands. Um, Heineken. Heineken bought Lagunitas. Lagunitas is not considered craft anymore. They still make good beer, right? Duvel brands. Well, I guess at least if you're going to sell out, you're going to sell out to Belgian Brewer. And then Founders. Mex um, Spanish brewing company bought them. You can justify it any which way you want. In bed is in Belgium, just to be fair. This is true. This is true. In is headquartered in Belgium. Um, so, you know, well, at least Heineken is a bunch of brewers, right? When was the last thing you, time you think any of those guys were down in the tanks actually brewing? Yeah, come on. Private equity. So this is, this is the way, this is your exit strategy. You either get bought or private equity kind of takes you over and or invests so heavily in you that you are still no, now no longer craft. So brands you may remember and love, Cigar City. I mean, this is, some of these breweries make the most sought after beers in the, in the country. And then I was most sad to hear about these two. So Dogfish took 15% money, 15% investment from a private equity company. They're still considered craft. That's good. Stone took 90 million. I don't know, it depends on how much of that percentage they actually got bought. Can you imagine Stone not being a craft brewer anymore? So, the, boo. <laughs> so the interesting thing about Stone specifically is that you know, the owner was like, hey, we gotta do something about InBev coming in and buying all of our awesome 
friends here in the beer industry. Let's get together and create a fund, and then we'll give money to people that need it, and the fund will provide it, and that'll be really great, and can everyone stay independent, and everyone stay happy, but if you need money, you can get it easily. Do you really think private equity is gonna be like so cool on that when they want an investment of what, two, three, five percent return on $90 million? Probably not. So some people stick with it though. They're like, you know what? Big beer, I have an opportunity to help change the way America drinks. I love this guy's optimism. He's staying at Elysian, he's not leaving. He's like, we're gonna do it. But that's not how I see things happening. <laughs> Just not. <laughs> I want it to be true, and I want great beer to still be available and easily available. And if you make beer in Seattle and your dad lives in Pennsylvania, yes, I want you to be, be able to get your beer to your dad. But does that also mean then taking up shelf space from my favorite brewery in my town? I'm not so sure about that. I can't even tell you how much this ad campaign threw me over the edge. <laughs> when you grow up in rural Maine, listening to Woody Guthrie every single Thanksgiving sing Alice's Restaurant, and then Budweiser renames their beer America for a branding campaign, and then puts Woody Guthrie's <laughs> lyrics on the can of beer. <laughs> <laughs> Can't even, can't even. So that's their idea of local, right? We're, <laughs> we're a Belgian brewer, you don't even know where we're located, who cares? We're gonna brand our beer America, and then next year we're gonna brand it France, and then we're gonna do it Argentina, and before you know it, we've taken over the world, which they already have. So the other way to do it is actually to appeal to very specific verticals and crowds. Like if you're watching the Patriots this year, or any of your favorite mm -hmm. NFL teams, it's amazing how much they've worked in the branding for Bud Light and this can specifically. Gotta collect them all. This is also their idea of local versus, you know, of, of local, which is taking over your entire tap line. So next time you go to a brewery, I mean, to a, a restaurant that's not a craft brewery, um, craft beer restaurant, take a look at the craft, at the beer list. So the beer list, you're gonna see some obvious choices, some smaller breweries, everyone else. But if you start digging down a little bit, you're gonna start seeing a re repetition of brands that you know are owned by Anheuser-Busch. And that is just part of this takeover. So yeah, you can have your Blue Point, and that's a pale ale, that's great. Of course, maybe something from uh, Anna or something on from um, Goose Island. And, hey, that's great, I get, look at all these choices, but you really don't have any choice. And where you really don't have any choice is the sports stadiums who have exclusive deals with beer and beer distributors. And this is where you're gonna start seeing a lot of pseudo craft start coming into your choice of beers for $14 a cup. This matters a lot. It's a false sense of choice. Sorry, it limits competition. Monopolizes the supply chain. So when you are the biggest brewer in the world and you own 32% of the market, what else do you own? You own access to hops, you own access to shelf space, you own access to aluminum cans. Um, buying rivals, squeeze costs, right? <clears throat> Avoid paying taxes. Th this is what we've seen, and this is what we'll continue to see. Um, and this is why it matters. This is why I get really upset by this, because this is not just any industry. It's also one that you may love and care about quite a bit. So to just step back a, a little bit to prohibition time. So um, prohibition ended in 1933. It was the 18th Amendment. It was outlawed alcohol, beer. We enter this time of austerity. So one of the factors, one of the populations, one of the communities that helped end prohibition was actually women. Because women also wanted the right to vote. And it's a liberty thing. Like you should be able to drink your alcohol if you want to drink it. You should also be able to drink it safely because a lot of times alcohol was laced with gasoline, I don't know, ethyl, whatever they could possibly cut it with, much like drugs these days, and especially illegally. So if alcohol was then legal, and then it was taxed, then the government would be happy, we'd have safe beer, and everyone would have this ability to get access to your alcohol. So that was how, how they did. They just created a three-tier system, so you would, the brewer would brew the beer, and then the distribut distributor would pick up the beer, and then give it to the retailer. So in no way should the brewer then influence the retailer and or 
then be able to just give the beer direct to the retailer because then it could be the distributor was seen as like this the safe haven. So what we have though, all these years later, almost 100 years later, problems with the system, three-tier system, right? So the, the rules have barely changed since the 1930s. Pay to play is alive and well. Pay to play is when a distributor goes into a bar and says, we will give you $5,000 cash if you will then please um, only put these beers on your tap. Or we try to promote this beer, where you give it like exclusive special happy hour prices or whatever it may be. So the distributors are really getting into it because the more that they sell, the more that they make. I mean, this is the whole point of being a distributor. So in Boston, we had this terrible problem happen two, three years ago where Dan Paquette, the brewer of Pretty Things, said, hey, guess what, everybody? Pay to play is alive and well, and it's happening in Boston. And I know this for a fact, because my beer isn't part of the pay to play. And I think that's wrong. And everyone's like, well, what is he talking about? So it turns out his beer distributor, the Craft Beer Alliance was, I believe that's what they're called now, was offering $5,000 um, bribes to bars to carry certain beers. And or they were being told, hey, for five grand, we'll carry your beer. There were like, five different restaurants and one was a restaurant group. So that's really, you know, restaurant groups tend to have five to 10 different restaurants. So it infiltrated this entire system. And now like two or three year, years mm -hmm. later, people kind of remember this, but what they remember more was really Dan Paquette being like, this is happening and everyone else saying, no it's not. So Big Beer actually owns <laughs> part of or all some distributors where they possibly can. So then that means Big Beer makes the beer, Big Beer distributes the beer, and Big Beer has dedicated shelf space. So uh, a liquor store, a packy, as we call it in Boston, is only so big, so you can only fit so much on each shelf. So when Budweiser can come in and say, we're gonna fill 75% of your shelf with our product, then that's how much they do, that's what they do. So <coughs> this is Grimm. They're based in Brooklyn, New York, fantastic brewery. Uh, they had this interesting discussion happen on their Instagram account about, um, second of all, yeah, I didn't really realize that Instagram was a place that people had conversations like this, but they do. They were like, our beer costs $2.10 per can, and then the distributor takes their cut, so it's about a little over three bucks, and then we give it to the retailer, and the retailer can basically charge whatever they want. So if you're seeing our beer selling at $8 a can, don't yell at us. That's nothing to do with us. Can you imagine not being in control of your blood, sweat, and tears like that? So, this is my happy place. So I get really agitated about big beer. I think about Greensboro, Vermont, Hill Road. At the very tippy top is Hill Farmstead Brewery. Sean Hill is one of those mavericks. He's a philosopher brewer, as I like to call him. And he's just like, listen, if you want my beer, you have to come to me. So the unicorns, the startups, the breweries, the small craft breweries are doing so well and have seen so, so much success, are kind of doing some really interesting things to avoid you know, being seen or, or just selling out. They want to be part of the community, they want to survive, they want to thrive. So these five particular breweries have become employee-owned enterprises. Um, Harpoon in Boston just happened like last year. And what this allows them is it allows them to have capital. And then your employees are completely 100% part of the company. Treehouse, also in Massachusetts. In four years, they are so enormous. They don't distribute a single drop of beer. Everyone comes to them to get it. And yes, I have waited in line to get my six pack or my four pack of beer, and it's delicious. But what they needed to do, and this is like their eighth expansion is to actually take over significant space and invest a ton of money. So $18.5 million facility will be built. It's almost done like next year or so. Um, mm -hmm. Enormous, 53,000 square feet. They're banking on that $132 case beer being maintainable. They took money too, but they took it from a private public um, partnership called Mass Development. So in Massachusetts, this is I think the sixth brewery that they have funded. Not completely, but just enough for everyone to have skin in the game because Massachusetts realizes part of the economy that runs Massachusetts is beer. So I, I mentioned Dan Paquette earlier. Some breweries don't even have the infrastructure costs of having a brewery. They're gypsy brewers, right? Much like our friends at Stillwater. Um, they 
brew at other facilities. Mm -hmm. That cuts down on costs. That allows you to do a lot of <coughs> MVP products. I couldn't believe it when I, when I saw this. I actually said, holy shit. When you own the supply chain and you can self-distribute your own beer, like Lossus <coughs> does in Vermont, you actually show up on the sales scanners in convenience stores. And this is one of the, the verticals that they actually um, look at in the industry. It's like how much beer is being sold in convenience stores. Well, in Vermont, $2.3 million of sip of sunshine is being sold each year. That's bananas. Like, of course I knew Lawson's was doing well. Of course I like to drink their beer. Did I realize it was that big of a, that one beer brought in that much money? The other interesting thing are um, distributors, and I found these two examples in Maine. I'm sure there are others, but specifically Maine, which I love because as Maine goes, so goes the nation. <laughs> <laughs> said like a true Mainer. Um, vacation land distributor, they're like, hey, this is ridiculous. Big beer distributors are not great. They're not good for Maine. They're not good for beer. Let's do this um, in a way that actually helps people out. So traditionally, if you enter on a distributor agreement, you're locked in. You cannot divorce your distributor. So if you don't like the fact that they sell to convenience stores that put your beer at $8 a can, if you don't like the fact that they have your beer sitting around in warehouses for two years getting skunky, if you don't like any of that, you can't do anything about it unless you show material damage. And you can imagine the process you have to go through to show this. So basically, you're locked in. So what they decide to do at Vacation Land Distributors is say, hey, listen, let's actually have a contract. We can both review it every year and resign it. Imagine that. Um, Bissell Brothers, this is an a ex-employee, and he decided to do his own distributorship as well. And he just happened to buy the van from Bissell Brothers. He's not actually associated with Bissell Brothers, except they are his only client right now. So now Bissell Brothers has an independent distributor who's willing to distribute their beer at a significantly less than 30% cut. So distributors in Maine take 30% of your beer. So that helps small beer. That helps craft a lot. Um, <coughs> Jim Cook is even getting in on this, right? He's like, the legislation that runs our country is so completely out of date, you have to start being an activist. Because if you don't, your industry is going to collapse. Because the, the rules that govern alcohol are so strict, and they're so varied across so many states, that you can't actually have free competition in enterprise. The other really important thing is if you like beer, you should seriously think about beer when you go to the polls, and you should really vote. So call your legislature. Let's start talking about this particular act, which gives tax breaks to small craft brewers. It's called the Small Brew Act, right? So HR 232. Do not confuse it with the Fair Beer Act, which was sponsored, of course, by Big Beer. So you can see that they're already trying to undercut what's possible in, in the state, in the um, House of Representatives by just trying to uh, introduce a piece of legislation that will confuse everyone. Like, oh, what's the difference between small beer and fair beer? Isn't fair beer better than small beer? So this sounds familiar to us in the software industry. Not too long ago, maybe still is, Microsoft was considered the evil empire, but, you know, this brewer is very much saying, like, when we came up as the rebel force <coughs> taking on an evil empire, that gives us em community. And that is still what you're going to start seeing more and more of. It's definitely going to be us versus them. And you're going to have to pick a side. So, I don't know how you feel about this next topic. However, there is a referendum uh, in Massachusetts, and actually in a number of states across the country this November, about legalizing marijuana. And we talked, see, my talk's like wrapping everyone's talks up today. So the important part about this is that who do you, well, first of all, a lot of states have it. Everyone's super interested in Colorado, what's going on there. A lot of money coming into the industry, a lot of people visiting, a lot of people enjoying the benefits of having marijuana be legalized. Um, a lot of money. I mean, these, this is 2014 numbers, so you can imagine it's significantly much, for, much more for 2016. Um, but uh, no, no state is going to turn down that money. So $2.4 billion over these um, states that have it legalized. Alaska is also in the all others. So, but there are people who are not okay with legalized pot. <coughs> in Massachusetts, this guy on the left is the mayor of Boston. His name's Marty. This guy on the right is the governor of the Commonwealth. His name is Charlie, and they're both against legalized marijuana. 
the other people that have come out against marijuana, strangely, is the Markley Group. And the Markley Group runs the data center at 1 Summer Street. So if anyone runs any kind of internet or telecommunications uh, company on the Eastern Seaboard, that's where it all lives. That's where it comes in. So that's a massive, strange tie-in to technology and, and um, being against marijuana for, for some reason I'm not sure of. But the second highest donor to the anti-legalization effort in Massachusetts is the Cronin Group. And the Cronin Group is a group of restaurants that were indicted in the pay-to-play scandal. So it's all kind of coming back full cycle, right? Third highest contributor to the uh, anti-legalization of marijuana effort in, Mar in Massachusetts is the beer distributors pack. Because beer does not want marijuana to be legal, then you'll have a choice of how you spend your afternoon, morning, whatever. <laughs> um, and as we know, you know, having access to something that may be helpful for you when you're recovering from a spinal cord injury is kind of great. So the beer industry, those super super uh, cagey, right? They're gonna play both sides of this game. So not only are, is the beer industry spending money against legalization of marijuana, they are also at the same time saying, well, if you have to legalize marijuana, guess what? We have the best system <laughs> to distribute your Mary Jane hash, all your edibles. We're just gonna put it into this three-tier system and we're gonna get the bud from the farm, we're gonna put it on the shelves, everything's gonna be labeled, and we're gonna give you the taxes, states. So you don't have to deal with all these little growers and all these little shops. We're gonna put it in the liquor stores. And that's exactly what's happening in Massachusetts. The, the plan is you're gonna see shelves and shelves of uh, water pipes and <coughs> products right next to your Jameson's and um, Ballast Point. So now they're gonna join forces with big beer. So you're gonna have big beer, big pot, lobbying in Washington, D.C. One of the interesting things about big beer is S.A.B. Miller, specifically, 26% of it is owned by this company called Altria. Altria, you may know, is formerly known as Philip Morris. So then you have big tobacco involved with big pot and big beer in this way to like kind of just own the entire system. Why that's important is that if I worked my entire life to build a brewery, to build a brand, to build a portfolio of delicious beer, and I sell it to Anheuser-Busch, and I know they're a big company, but do I know, also know that Altria and Philip Morris are also making money? Philip Morris has identified that beer is one of its biggest growing sectors. So when does Philip Morris have a sector? Well, they do now. So in the next few years, we're gonna see a couple, a couple things. This is me. See in the future. More big beer takeovers. But the interesting thing, it may not be other beer companies. Some people have said that the Voltron of beer may actually become the Voltron of canned beverages. Anheuser-Busch now has a lot of money, a lot of responsibility to the shareholders, a lot of employees, lots of bottling um, companies across the world, <coughs> lots of distribution routes. Why don't they buy Coca-Cola? Who cares? You're just swapping one beverage for another. Why don't they buy ball, the aluminum cans? What if they just keep buying parts of the entire system so then your beer actually doesn't get anywhere unless you are in the Anheuser-Busch system? Biggish beer. Biggish. So that's your Heineken's and Duvel's and everyone else. They'll start consolidating. How else are you going to compete against a monster that owns 32% of the market? Hopefully we're going to start seeing some innovation come out of big beer that's not necessarily only shock top. You're going to see a lot more competition, uh, cooperation among craft brewers. Craft brewers in general cooperate a ton. You're going to see a lot more um, introduction of new business models with those craft brewers. They're going to be like, what else can we possibly do? How else can we actually engage people, keep this uh, profitable and long-sustaining um, endeavor? And then breweries are going to have to, and you've probably already noticed already, do way more than just beer. Every, almost all the breweries in Massachusetts, well, I should say a bunch of them, have started to open uh, tasting rooms and brew, um, brew pubs, right? Because they need to keep as much money to themselves as possible. And this is one way to take back control of that distribution system. Uh, relaxation of legislation. Hopefully this happens because we definitely need modernization to come to beer laws. 
So for us, the beer drinkers, surf the hype curve. We are on this for a while. Like we're gonna see more and more breweries open up, more and more specialized breweries. One just opened in Cambridge and they only do sours. Awesome, I like sours. Become an activist for craft beer. Toast your taxes with a craft beer. Fight the power. Get the stickers. So this was actually at um, a brew fest in Boston a couple weeks ago. This guy had them all over his shirt. I'm like, oh my God, where did you get these stickers? He's like, oh, would you like some? And I said, yes. So think about it. Start being that like force in your supermarket. That's not craft beer. That's shock top. That's Lagunitas. Sorry, guys. Love it, but not so much. Most importantly, drink your independent local craft beer, even if it is pumpkin peach ale. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.